Let's, we'll catch up. So um, I, was just, I was telling you guys about naturopathic doctors. Um, so we are primary care doctors. And um, the reason some of you may not have heard of us is that it, this is actually our 10th year anniversary that we are licensed in the state of California. So it's actually a big deal. Um, many of our neighboring states have been licensed for decades and decades, I mean like maybe 30, 40 years, and it was a huge victory for California. Now we have a medical school um, that is a um, naturopathic medical school, so you're going to see a lot more of us. Um, we're basically, um, in, in, you know, we work as, as a team with other primary care doctors like MDs or DOs, nurse practitioners, um, you know, physician assistants, and um, the areas that we um, focus a lot on is uh, basically blending centuries old of wisdom with current scientific advances. And um, you know, it covers anywhere from geriatrics to pediatric to geriatric care, so it's family medicine. Um, I'll just take a few steps back. Um, so basically, I'm, I'm a, a naturopathic doctor, graduate of Vassar University, which is in Seattle, and now there's one in San Diego. Um, and um, we focus a lot on chronic health conditions, um, and a lot of it is, is looking at the areas from a root cause. Um, just put a little disclaimer here, because I, I want to make sure you guys, um, whatever suggestions I give, you always consult with your own doctor. Because, um, you know, it's, it's all about individualized medicine, so I just thought I'd um, bring that up. And so today we're going to talk about, I thought, see today as like a checklist. So when, you, when we talk about these areas, see how much of it you're doing or how much of it you can make a note for yourself. The handouts may be areas you can highlight and say, okay, let's work on this today. Um, and so I just thought I'd bring up some areas. I, I kind of use the word graceful aging because ultimately we're talking about longevity, right? So I thought, what are some common practices we can apply into our daily health that really extends our quality of life? Um, and these are some areas we'll talk about. So um, as you can see here, MDs are primary care doctors, similar to DOs and MDs. We do go to a four-year postgraduate medical school, and in addition to the standard curriculum, we look at um, areas in natural therapies. Um, we are licensed by the um, Department of um, Bureau of Naturopathic Medicine Department of Consumer Affairs, and we look at diagnosing and treating um, health conditions. These are some areas we look at. The, the primary is obviously the things that you guys do every day, and that's why I like these talks, is I can educate you guys to be your own best doctor. So the things you do, you know, the way you eat, the way you sleep, the way you talk, move, think, all of those makes a difference in, in terms of how your health is. And, you know, we can use other therapies to really bring out the lifestyle practices that you do on your own. So let's start with the first one. So we know that the father of medicine, Hippocrates, said, let food be your medicine and medicine your food. Um, rather than getting in a discussion of, um, I don't know, Atkins versus, um, you know, the high fat, the vegan, the vegetarian, like there's so many different, um, you know, uh, types of um, diets, right? Um, rather than getting into that argument, because people always say, what's the best diet? And I get back to them and I say, well, what's the best diet for you? Um, it's really that your body should be the one telling you. I think no um, nutritionist or doctor is going to disagree that we all need vegetables, right? So rather than looking at the differences between, um, you know, is it better to be vegetarian? Is it better to, you know, eat high, low protein, all of that? Obviously, moderation is important, but I want to highlight the common areas that rather than getting lost in the details of like, what's the percentage of this, this, that should I eat? Let's talk about whole foods, real foods, rather than um, kind of um, what's the perfect diet that's kind of cookie cutter. So the first tip I want to tell you guys is eat in a relaxed setting, right? No matter what you're eating, you want to eat in a relaxed setting. So this is one of my favorite, you know, cartoons growing up, Dennis the Menace. But I, I like the bottom. It says, wow, this pie is delicious, mom. I think my taste buds are blooming. We'll just substitute <laughs> pie for salad. <laughs> but the point being that they're sitting down and they're eating. And when you're present with your food, you can actually taste your food. And you know you can actually have a connection. You can have a sense of fullness, or you can have actually understand what your the feedback your body is giving you, right? And a lot of us don't do that, right? Especially in this area, we're always in a rush. So why is this important? Well, first of all, digestion begins in your mouth. It doesn't start in your stomach or in your intestines. It starts with the process of chewing. I would. 
would even argue it starts from thinking about the food. So you want to kind of start that process earlier. And chewing your food, but also thinking about that, it takes a while for your brain and your gut to get a feedback. So people who say, I don't feel full, and they're you know, kind of eating their food really fast, well, it takes about 20 minutes for your brain to have a sense of fullness. So the more you chew your food, the more you buy yourself time to really kind of digest. Um, also being mindful of what you put in your mouth, right? Not just eating in front of the TV or on your desk and rushing. So why is that important? Yikes, we cut off a little bit, but that's okay. Um, so if you guys look at um, your nervous system, we got two pathways. We've got your sympathetic nervous system. That's that fight or flight, or the one that kind of gets you out of danger or gets you to perform a certain you know, task. The um, parasympathetic is the one that um, is more in that relaxed state. So when you're in the fight or flight or sympathetic state, look what your eyes doing is dilated, right? It's like when you're afraid, your eyes are wide open, you're like ready to run for danger, right? And so let's look at the rest of your, your body. Your heart is, um, so it's a salivary, um, uh, basically inhi inhibit salivation, because last thing you want to do is digest your food if you're running for danger. Um, your lungs are relaxed so that oxygen's going in. Your heart is accelerated, right? When you're in a state of running for your life, your heart's beating fast to get you to run. And then look at down here, it says inhibits digestive activity. So when you're in a fight or flight, your body's digestive system is actually rather inhibited, right? That's why it's important not to eat on the run. But when you're in a relaxed state, in a parasympathetic state, look at digestion. It stimulates digestive activity. So just the process of being present and relaxed is going to encourage digestion. So that's why I said, rather than getting lost in the details of what should I eat, you know, even the best foods, you want to eat in a setting that allows your body to assimilate. Okay? So here are some do's and don'ts. Here's the do. Eat in a relaxed setting in a park. Um, you know, it's okay to read the paper. This guy looks like he's reading something funny, smiling, so that would be fine. Um, you know, if you're at work, you can dine in a social setting. Um, the don't is, you know, eating behind your desk, eating, who knows, you know, watching a TV program, that's stressful, or, um, or eating, you know, while driving, right? And a lot of us are guilty of that. Just make sure that you're more mindful of the setting that you put yourself in when you eat. Tip number two. Moderation. So again, like I said, I don't want to get lost in the details of like, you know, is veganism better than vegetarianism, or you know, is paleo better than Atkins, or all of that. I mean, we can have a whole day of discussion about that. I just want to get behind those and say, no matter what, moderation is the key. The all or nothing is what gets us in trouble, right? So people say, okay, after New Year's Eve, I'm never going to touch, I don't know, a piece of pie again, or I'm never going to have champagne again. It's like, okay, well, how long is that going to last? I've seen people do that, and then you know, six months later, they attack. <laughs> They're like, okay, catch up time. So, you know, the 80-20 rule is typically very good. Um, you know, 80% of the time, if you follow something that's good for your health, the other 20, you might be able to get away with it. I mean, you could have a, maybe a smaller wiggle room if you're diabetic, you know, I wouldn't overdo the sugars, or if you have high cholesterol, you know, would call in the anti-inflammatory diet. But in the general rule, the 80-20 seems to be pretty good. Some people even say, like, you know, maybe six days out of the week, and then that one not one day, maybe the Friday night or the gatherings, that's, that would be okay. Um, if you want to kind of generalize your plate, that's another um, way of thinking about what would be a balanced or moderation kind of diet. So have you guys heard of the plate model? Has anyone heard of that? So if you visualize your plate and cut it in half, half of it should be vegetables. Um, and this is really helpful if you are eating out because, um, you know, it's hard to kind of measure what, what is what, but if you kind of visualize your plate, rather than filling the entire plate with a bowl of pasta and then later going, oh, I eat too much, you could just visualize, cut it in half, make half of it your vegetables. This could be anything from a salad like lettuce, kale, spinach. Could be like sauteed greens, bok choy, you know, anything that's like, like your dark green leafy. And then cut the other half into quarters. So a quarter of that should be your starch. It could be yams, potatoes, could be your grains like you know winter squash, um, well grains like quinoa or rice. And then it could be beans or squashes. And then the other quarter is your protein. So whether or not you're vegetarian or not, you could um, have you know tofu, eggs, legumes, 
or if you need to have lean meats, fish, or poultry. Okay, so it kind of gives you an idea of balancing um, your, your ratio of the vegetables and um, other food groups. Um, this is in your handout. Um, I don't know if I have this specific list, but at least I have the website. Um, it's Eat Right America. It kind of helps you um, prioritize where your nutrient-dense foods come from. So ANDI stands for Aggregate Nutrient Density Index. So it's an index that um, basically reflects the quality of vitamins. The higher the vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, um, the higher the score will be. So you can see foods, this is why kale gets such a big reputation, or collard greens, bok choy, these are getting a high score of a thousand, or I think anywhere you know in the 500 or above would be a very nutrient dense, rich food. And then if you look down, the lowest score is cola <laughs> at 0.6. Some argue it's a minus one because it's a diuretic. Um, it's kind of a diuretic and it makes you lose your B vitamins. Um, not to say that, for example, olive oil with a score of nine is bad. It's just not a nutrient dense food. It's a good source of omega three fats, but that's all it's got. So if you wanted to get your biggest bang for your buck in terms of nutrition, you want to follow those high score nutrient dense foods. And again, you could get this from that website on your handout. Um, the other one, uh, oh, this is also in a in little chart. Um, this is basically some of the power foods that I, I typically recommend. So you can see the leafy greens are that Andy score. And then I put cruciferous vegetables. You know, what's interesting is I kept reading over the many years that, you know, broccoli helps prevent cancers and all kinds of cancers. And I thought, well, why? And then the more we read about it, it's got a couple components. One is that it's rich in um, what we call endo 3 carbonyl, which is basically a substance that helps you metabolize the bad estrogen. So especially with breast cancer, sometimes the, the, the cells are sensitive to the effect of estrogen on the cell. So basically what cruciferous vegetables do is they metabolize the bad estrogen so it doesn't have an effect on the estrogen receptor in the breast tissue. Um, it could be the same for cervical cancer, uterine cancer, or even prostate cancer has been shown to be helpful. So um, that's one component. The other one is that it's rich in B vitamins. So that also can, can um, you know, prevent your onset of, of um, or triggering cancer. So that's the cruciferous vegetables. Um, and you guys can kind of maybe use this as a checklist. Um, I won't read them one by one, but that could be part of your shopping list. Um, the other shopping list is in your handout. It's the rainbow diet. So you can go shopping according to the colors of your foods. The more colors you eat, the more variety and the more um, uh, you know, basically antioxidants you, you get in your diet. And that comes handy later when we talk about anti-aging. So just a little preview, we'll talk more about that. So what to avoid? And that's a really big thing I always try to tell you guys, right? As much as we talk about what to eat, I want to emphasize what not to eat, right? You don't want to eat a bunch of crap and then make up for it. Why not just eat, not eat the junk, right? So soda is probably one of the worst things. Um, I think you just basically kind of infuse a ton of sugar. Um, it's carbonated, so it's hard on the bones. It leaches calcium out of the bones. There should be absolutely no nutrition in there. Remember that cola with that score? Um, same thing with artificial sweeteners. You're actually better off having some, you know, pure cane sugar than artificial. Um, we'll take questions for the end, but just go ahead. Yeah. When you said carbonated, uh -huh. how about salts or water? Um, so that's not something you would avoid, maybe um, reduce. So if the question was salts or water or just carbonated water, um, that can be a problem in excess because it's still carbonated and um, it's, it's basically rich in phosphoric acid and that can leach calcium out of your bones as well. So I would limit that, but at least it doesn't have sugar and food colorings and all the other stuff that comes with soda. It's a great question. Yeah. How do you feel about avoiding salt? Um, I would limit salt, and you're better off doing maybe um, sea salt or, you know, just don't do like, if when you eat fast foods, it's going to be loads of salt, that's probably not the best thing. But if you add some salt to your, you know, meals, it's fine, yeah. So, yeah, avoiding artificial sweeteners, high fructose corn syrup, it should be nowhere in your diet list. 
um, MSG. Actually, um, there was a great article, um, I think Judy, you posted that, I'm um, really thankful, um, on how MSG tricks your brain because it's got, basically it's monosodium glutamate, it tricks your brain into thinking that it's still hungry. It kind of blocks the full sensation. Um, not to mention that a lot of people are allergic to it and it can even trigger full blown migraines. But that's interesting, that feedback, it kind of makes you keep eating and eating and eating. So it's, it's a chemical, it should not be anywhere in your diet. Um, hydrogenated oils, avoid that. Um, I put food sensitivities as well. For some people, the presence of gluten, soy, corn, dairy, anything they're sensitive to is enough to trigger inflammatory conditions. So if you know you have those food sensitivities, definitely avoid it. Um, processed foods, no one should be eating that. I always say, um, I've heard that the um, lifespan or like the, um, what's it called? Um, if you like leave out a, a ding dong for a hundred years, it still stays the same way. So. That to me is a processed food, they did something to it to keep it that way. So avoid those artificial colors, artificial sweeteners I mentioned, and then obviously um, quit smoking, which we know has about 3,000 carcinogens, so avoiding that. Um, and then toxic burdens, um, I think I put on your handout the, um, I always mention the environmental working group, ewg.org. Um, it's a really, really great um, consumer website. Um, it has a list of, um, you know, what cleaning agents to use, what which ones to avoid that have higher chemical concentrations. It has a list of um, fish that are highest in mercury. Um, it, it's very, very good information. And it also has a list of what we call the dirty dozen. So the top 12 foods that are rich in pesticides and the ones to avoid and get organic. So it's a really, really great website. Um, so these are some examples of toxic burden. So it's, it's basically an accumulation of toxins that we should avoid. So um, phthalates and bisphenol A are rich in plastic. So you'll see actually some plastics that label that says phthalate free. Um, aluminum and deodorants, um, cleaning chemicals, cosmetics and lotions. Easiest way, by the way, to absorb your, your lotions, right? If there's toxins in the lotion, lather on your skin, it avoids the first pass effect from your, because your liver, if it sees a toxin, it's gonna try to detoxify, right? But if you put it on your skin, it's gonna bypass your liver, and it's gonna go right into your blood. So lotions are actually, in my opinion, one of the worst things if it's a lot of chemicals in that lotion. So definitely look at clean, hypoallergenic, free of um, any kind of preservatives um, or you know, phthalates, that sort of thing in your, in your lotions. Um, and then pesticides and food additives. So this is that example I was mentioning with the dirty dozen. So um, these are the top 12 rich um, foods and pesticides that you want to avoid and get organic. And then typically these foods in the clean 15 um, don't require um, pesticides because they either have like a thick skin or just you know in insects aren't interested. So um, you don't necessarily need to get these organic if you want to prioritize the dirty dozen. Um, you know, going further, avoiding farm-raised fish. Basically, they're just um, infusing tons of fish into a small environment and giving them tons of antibiotics so they don't get you know infected from each other. So it's just the worst place, um, the worst environment, um, unfortunately. Um, same thing with meats. And then um, limiting seafood high in mercury. You can use the EWG, but. Um, you know, the bigger fish eat the little fish and accumulate their mercury. So that's why tuna typically tends to be a high mercury um, fish, and that's the most common one. Um, and then always, 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 you know, make sure you don't follow this. Do not microwave plastics um, because it leaches the, um, you know, all the chemicals from the plastic into your food. Um, and then eat at least uh, 25 grams of fiber, I would argue maybe 30 or 35 to try to trap some of those toxins um, you know, in, in a daily kind of way to get rid of the toxins out of your diet. Um, you know, the other thing I thought about is, um, you know, we talked about soda, is um, I've, I've heard even the process of carrying the soda in the trucks where it's like a hot environment can actually create a chemical um, composition, so it's not even, I mean, I'm picturing microwave plastic, but I'm also picturing what happens to that can when it's being carried, you know, um, transported. So it just, you know, you really want to know where your food's coming from. Um, so obviously don't forget water. In fact, if you look at the centers of your brain, water and um, food are in the same center. So a lot of times people confuse thirst for hunger. So you want to make sure you're fully hydrated. A lot of times when people are fatigued in the afternoon, it's due to dehydration. So um, a good rule to follow is that take your weight in pounds 
and the minimum is a third of that in ounces. Okay, but a good average is about half of your weight in pounds converted to ounces. So a 160 pound person needs about 80 ounces of water or about 10 cups a day. And that's taken into account, especially if you're active and you're sweating. Or people think that just because it's a summer day and they're sweating, that they, they don't need it in the winter. But guess what? You, you, you know, in, even in the winter, you're, you're losing water. So um, basically all year round. Did you have a question? Yeah. So over the radio, I, I hear about uh, water being very much dead in terms of due to the heavy filtering and uh, all sorts of things. In terms of minerals? Well, yes. Is um, there any uh, additives you can have? Well, you know, you might want to think about like a reverse osmosis kind of water because they actually take spring water and they, they filter out the you know bad stuff but then they add back the good stuff. But in general, if you're eating a lot of vegetables, you're getting your mineral dietarily. So I would say I don't know how next you know valuable that is. I would just remove some of it. If we can save questions for the end because we're being recorded. Bullet. What's second that? Second bullet. Is that really what you meant to oh, say? Oh, dehydration can be mistaken for hunger. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Skipping to the next one. Um, so I want to kind of target the rest of the talk around aging, as I mentioned, because I think um, a lot of times we talk about anti-aging, but I want to think about the word graceful aging. Um, and, you know, by definition, we know that age is basically a process over time and it's a multi-dimensional process. So it's basically both um, physical, psychological, and social. And there, it's basically about expansion as much as it is about contraction, right? It could be that our, our um, reaction time may not be as, as quick when we're older than younger, but the wisdom that we gain, you know, we, we keep gaining as we grow, right? So it's basically that process of expansion and, and contraction. Um, but you know what we want to think about again is, is the word great, um, graceful. So some of the aging signs, um, you know, and I kind of think about that apple example, right? Um, when you leave an apple out, when it gets oxygenated, it starts to get dark and it kind of shrinks, right? So um, if we think about wrinkles that way, um, we want to say, well, how can we protect our body from? kind of degenerating and what things can we do. So it's and have, have you guys heard of like you could put some lemons on the apple to save it from browning? Have you guys heard that? Mm -hmm. So part of that is actually the antioxidant effect. So that, I just want to have some visions in your mind, but we're going to talk more about that, how to kind of preserve your kind of body from um, the effects of free radicals. Um, other signs of aging, osteoporosis, arthritis, heart disease, and Alzheimer's. Some of these we call chronic degenerative um, conditions in that um, they really should not be a part of aging. They're more the, the side effects of a poorly, you know, poorly controlled lifestyle and things that we really should be you know, preventing or preserving from happening. So um, I'm not sure where I got this from, but um, I'm grateful for um, this chart. I thought it was really well put together. Um, if you look at kind of the factors in aging, you could see part of it could be the effect of time, but the other parts are some things that are in your hand. So one of them is actually what your DNA does as a result of not only just the genetic information, but the environment affecting your genetic information. I'll talk more about that. The, the part of your DNA that encodes kind of the process of aging is called telomeres. So we'll talk more about that coming up. But the other two, you can see oxidative effect, stress. So one of them is, you know, we talk about stay away from the sun because that, that can have an oxidative effect on your skin. Well, the same thing internally. We want to prevent your DNA from having a, a, a damage of oxidation internally. So that's um, one other area. And then the last area is what we call glycation. So sugar actually is involved in the process of glycation and it can cause aging. So these are the areas I want to talk about. Um, so if you take a look at the word telomere, if you take a look at your DNA, so your DNA is basically like your genetic code, right? Like the way a computer scientist has coding to kind of run a certain program. This is your, your DNA is basically that. Um, and so um, basically when you look at the ends of the DNA, it's bound together by what we call a telomere. So you can compare that to like a shoestring, right? You know how your shoestring is held together by that little um, kind of tape at the end? Um, that's really what preserves your DNA from 
um, kind of staying whole and not getting, um, not being da um, affected by damage um, with aging. So, um, as you age, the length of this telomere gets shorter and shorter. And if you can picture the end of the shoestring, the shorter it gets, the more susceptible the rest of the string will be in terms of falling apart, right? So if you want to preserve your DNA, you want to protect the ending of the DNA, the telomere, from basically degrading and damaging the, the rest of your DNA. So what's really excited, exciting is that research is actually studying the telomere and it's, it's being able to measure the telomere so that if you guys have any lifestyle intervention, you can see pre and post and see how your telomere length um, is affected by that. So there's some studies I can share with you. One of them was um, a study where basically people were divided into two groups. And um, what they found was that, um, so I'll just read this, it says divided into two groups based on telomere length. The half with the longer telomere lived um, five years longer than the one with the short, um, shorter telomere. So that's basically um, correlating the length of the telomere with lifespan. Um, and basically what it did, I think if you guys take a look at in your handout, the first part where I quoted um, something from Dr. Mercola, um, I could actually read it out loud just for the recording. Um, it's basically talking about some of those factors. So it says, uh, smoking, drinking too much, lack of exercise, and poor diet can age you by 12 years. Uh, these findings come from um, a study that tracked close to 5,000 British adults for over 20 years. And over the course of the study, 29% of the people with all of the four unhealthy behaviors died. Only 8% died amongst those people with none of the four habits. So again, the connection between your lifestyle and um, aging. Um, so how can we protect those? Well, we talked about some of these up here, but some of it is actually protecting the enzyme called telomerase that affects the telomere. So they're, they're both related. And how do we do that? Well, things that negatively affect it is, is stress, inflammation, and oxidative stress. So um, basically, these are the factors that accelerate aging. And other factors that are involved is, is um, obviously time, genetics, and then lifestyle, the things that you do with your genes. So um, good diet, exercise, and again, stress management. And like I mentioned, a lot of the chronic diseases like heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and dementia are associated with shorter telomeres. So the shorter your telomeres, the more susceptibility you may have to these chronic illnesses. Um, so uh, this was interesting as well. So it says too much sugar causes wrinkles. Um, and so sugar triggers a natural process called glycation, remember that pie chart I was mentioning, um, which is the same chemical reaction that turns meat brown. And so um, basically sugar binds to these tissues and harms, um, causes a harmful molecule called advanced glycation end products, or ages. Uh, interesting, um, which damages the elastin and the collagen in your skin. So you know we talk about wrinkles, well wrinkles is basically the damage to the elasticity of your skin. So sugar can actually damage that. And this um, tends to be also uh, not only externally but internally seen in your kidneys, brain and other essential organs. And what was interesting was that um, even though um, it starts to show at about the age of 35, um, it doesn't mean that before that it's not happening. It's just that you know um, it has a cumulative effect and it really starts to show itself after the age of 35. So, um, and what was interesting with this study was that it wasn't just the obvious culprits like soda, it was actually the, glyce the high glycemic foods like the white breads, the pasta, the potatoes, all of those because in your body they convert to sugar, they're going to create these H-like molecules, the advanced glycation molecules. So that's why I had that pipe, the, the plate model for you guys in that you know, no matter what kind of diet you subscribe to, whether it's vegan, paleo, whatever it is, um, just keep in mind that the higher sugar content, that those high glycemic foods are, is really what causes the aging process. Um, and it's not just the, you know, the sodas and the processed stuff. So even, you know, a piece of bread, if you eat too much of it, can be a problem. 
Um, okay, so let's keep going here. So how do we slow it down? Um, low glycemic index diet, um, I'll go over what that means in case you guys don't, haven't heard of that term. And then antioxidants, have you guys heard of that word, antioxidants? So basically the opposite of that word is what we call free radicals. Um, what free radicals are is that in your body, um, well just chemically speaking, your body, um, chemicals like to be bound together, right? So when we talk about water, it's two hydrogen molecules and oxygen. But if there's something that breaks the bond between two molecules, it becomes an unstable compound. So what can break those molecules is the presence of a high temperature, like fast foods, if you, if you um, cook your foods in really high temperature, or if you create some kind of a free radical, it could be from um, you know, the, the smog in the environment or from cigarette smoking, anything that's introducing these unstable free radicals into your body, what happens is once it gets in there, it wants to bind to something um, to become stabilized. Well, guess what? Your arteries could be that. It could bind to that or it could bind to something in your system that can cause the um, disease process to start. So what antioxidants do is they're the first to get in there and bind to those molecules before that molecule can bind to your cells, okay? So that's part of what we call the preventing atherosclerosis or thickening of your arteries is that antioxidants can prevent free radicals from damaging your arteries, okay? Um, if you guys are more interested in that, I think um, heart disease is a really good model. Um, and if you take a look at, um, a really good book is actually The Sinatra Solution. Um, he talks about how cholesterol isn't the only thing that's a problem. It's actually the, the effect of oxidation on the cholesterol molecule causing heart disease, not just cholesterol by itself. So it goes back to um, you know, preventing the damage of free radicals. Um, so, um, the way we can look at it is, well, first of all, um, preventing the high glycemic food. So this could be things like candy, cookies, um, juices with added sugar, um, white potatoes, chips, sweetened cereals. I mean, how many kids are, what's their breakfast, right? They eat like these high sugar cereals and a glass of orange juice and off they go to school and their blood sugar's all, you know, everywhere, like up and down and it's just a big problem. So definitely avoiding high glycemic risk and then eating more whole foods like apples, berries, um, you know, legumes are low, nuts are low, seeds are low, um, you know, oatmeal is fairly good and then even, um, you know, unplain, uh, unsweetened plain yogurt would be fine. Um, and then going back to antioxidants, so you can see it protects your heart from atherosclerosis. It actually reduces the incidence of cancer, um, and it basically fights free radicals um, that are caused by sun exposure. So um, actually some of the um, anti-aging creams will say it has something like CoQ10 or vitamin C or some kind of a, um, antioxidant to protect your skin from damage. Um, and I kind of mentioned this, but some of the causes of these free radical or unstable <coughs> compounds is through pollution, radiation, cigarette smoke, herbicides, or high temperature cooking. And the easiest way to get that is through fast foods, because unfortunately a lot of fast food restaurants, they reuse the oils over and over and over. They don't throw it out every time they cook new. It just, you know, I'm, I've heard even a week that you know the French fries is kind of dipped into the same oil that was used a week ago, and basically you're just recycling your oil. So it's a really big problem. Um, some things to watch for yourselves as well is you know even though we know olive oil is good for you, you don't want to cook it in a high temperature because that can be susceptible to, to free radicals. So if you cook your food in olive oil, keep it in like moderate temperature. If you want to go higher into like a stir fry kind of thing, use coconut oil or maybe grapeseed oil. That would be fine. Um, and then obviously flax oil, you don't want to cook at all because that's really susceptible to heat. So you want to use that just in its own without heat. Um, and then other foods that are rich in antioxidants would be like your dark leafy green vegetables, tomatoes, red grapes. This is part of the French paradox, right? Um, berries like acai, pomegranates, really high in antioxidants, um, oranges, um, chocolate, green tea, and then your supplements like vitamin C, A, E, alpha lipoic acid, and CoQ10. Um, and that's why I put the rainbow diet in your handout is that the more colors you eat, the more flavonoids and antioxidants you get. Okay. So if you want a more like a detailed list, just look at the um, rainbow diet in your handout.
Um, okay, so I always talk about stress in every talk because um, I think a lot of health conditions are stress related and how it relates to rapid aging is that the release of cortisol or you know, that adrenaline rush that we talk about is what accelerates aging. And um, you know what is what it also does is that basically it um, increases that fight or flight. So our blood pressure goes up. It causes more heart disease-like symptoms. It actually shrinks the memory center, the hippocampus of the brain. Um, that's why a lot of people say, well, when I'm stressed, I, my my memory gets poor. Well, thankfully, that's that can be reversible if the stress goes away. So um, stress can have a lot of impact on our physiology. Um, so some of the techniques, as we know, it could be diaphragmatic breathing, meditation, yoga, nature walks, anything that helps you connect to not only nature, but the people around you, to your community. Um, and by skipping over this hand um, slide, I don't mean to underestimate any of its power. I think we could have a full session on just one of these alone. So um, definitely, you know, if that checklist I talked about, make sure that this is in your list. It's very, very important. Um, okay, how are we on time? Oh, we're good. Okay, so the other area I want to talk about with regards to aging is um, our body composition. So, um, you know, people sometimes they look and you go, oh, you don't look your age, you look 10 years longer. So your, your appearance can actually say a lot about your, your physiology as well. So some of the, the observations that we've made through time and the aging process is that what we find is that as we age, our body fat increases and our lean muscle mass decreases. So what can we do to reverse that? Exercise. Exercise. Lifting. lifting. So exercise is the single best way to prevent this. So it's, it's one of the best anti-aging tools that we have because what we know is that what exercise does is the opposite. It decreases body fat and it increases the lean muscle mass. And a lot of times your lean muscle mass is what gives you that tone and that sense of vitality, right? So that's the one you want to preserve. Um, so this should be really a vital part of our stress and anti-aging. And I think if you think about stress, as much as I think in our society we're, we're like a go, go, go nation, and you, you know, if any of my patients are watching right now, they would say, like, they would laugh. I, I literally write down my prescription do nothing <laughs> like get bored you know like just just sit down and just like you know do nothing like people are so busy doing stuff that by like telling them to do nothing they can get some space into their life right so that's a really important part of part of stress management but the other part is if there's stress in our system exercise can actually help you flush it out right so so our body needs movement i think evolutionally speaking that's what we're used to so um, there's actually a really great book called sitting kills and moving heels um, and um, i forgot it's by dr joan i forgot her last name but um, amazing book and if you guys look it up um, hopefully the library has it um, but it, it talks more about how movement is a great anti-aging tool um, and it doesn't have to be anything like, you know, Olympic style, right? Um, I think moderate is probably the best or even low intensity. It's better to do, again, that all or nothing. Um, you know, if you don't do any exercise, come January 1st, you join a gym and you run like 10 miles, you get sore, you're like, forget it, <laughs> right? Just build up to it. Um, so just best if it's progressive and gradual. Um, and I think the best feeling you want to you look for is to feel refreshed after the program. If, you're, if you find yourself exhausted, reevaluate your program and go, what else could I do? It could be that you're new. I mean, you know, when you first start lifting after a while, anybody can get sore. Give yourself that kind of an understanding. But um, if you keep doing it over time and you're not feeling like you're refreshed, just re-examine your exercise program and, um, you know, make sure that it's moderate enough for your body. So some of the components you want to look at Obviously aerobic is important, it's a process of oxygenating and what I say like filtering out some of the cortisol and the stress. But never neglect the, the strength, right, because we want to look at building muscle um, and flexibility. I think um, flexibility and strength are one of the best tools that we have to prevent osteoporosis because that's not even just about bones degrading, it's about having the balance and strength to not increase the risk of fractures and to protect our, our you know, structural integrity. So, Definitely you want to look at all three as the components of exercise. Um, and I think a lot of exercises hit, you know, some or all of this, you know, walking, 
um, jogging if you prefer, or any sports like um, tennis or basketball or yoga with strength and flexibility, Pilates. You've got a lot of different swimming, a lot of different exercises to capture those. Um, okay, so how do we know we're on the right track? I think besides listening to your body and seeing how exercise makes you feel, you can actually measure some of these. So, um, you know, a lot of people know about, you know, the scale, right? But what they don't know is um, what component of their body is pure muscle and what is pure fat. They cannot tell that from just checking their weight. Um, even a body mass index won't tell you that. What it'll tell you is your height and your weight and the score that is called the BMI. But what if um, you are slightly high on that because you're very muscular? Well, the BMI won't be able to tell you if, if your weight is coming from pure muscle or pure body fat. It's just basically a score. So um, the last two to me are a little bit more helpful. Looking at your waist to hip ratio or more the waist circumference. Um, and some even call, rather than weight management, they say waste management because um, it's actually, you know, uh, and some of it is genetic. Um, you know, some people, they carry most of their weight. It's like the pear shape. They carry their weight around their hips. And that really can't be changed. It is genetic, but others carry it more around their center. And if it's more around the center, your organs are there, right? So with the, the fatty tissue can actually go around there and affect that. Um, you know, there's a condition called fatty liver, for example, where you know the, the more fat you have around your, your midsection, the more there's fat around your liver, and it can actually impact your liver function. So that's kind of um, why that area is um, the waist circumference is important. Um, the last one is a body bio uh, bioelectric impedance analysis. It's basically um, take a look at that. So it's basically looking at breaking down your body composition. So it'll tell you out of your overall assessment how much of your weight is lean mass fat and then how much is water. And so a good example would be that, you know, you got two people, they have the exact same weight, but when you break down their body composition, this person has a lot more um, healthy muscle than that person who has um, more um, excess fat. So there are even some people we call skinny fat, right? They're, they're um, on the scale it looks good, but they're, they have a lot of higher body fat content and not as much muscle. So um, one of the ways to measure that is a bioimpedance. It's kind of like an EKG. It's like an electrical way of assessing your body composition. So it's a good way to guide you um, in terms of what is the right <laughs> exercise plan. Uh, because actually some people, they do too much cardio when they're exercising and they lose some muscle. So it helps you kind of guide in terms of, well, do a little bit more weight. So do a little bit more flexibility. Pre preserve kind of your structural integrity rather than just you know, run. <laughs> Okay, last but not least, I put that one last in case people go to sleep after I <laughs> talk about it. So we're actually way ahead of time. Um, this is the last part of the handout, and then um, we'll have time for question, and answer, and discussion. So um, I think, you know, even though this is last, it's just as important because if you don't sleep, your body won't get a chance to repair and regenerate, right? So if someone's tired, you know, no. Um, energizing food, no um, B vitamins or anything that's fatigue related is going to help you unless you sleep and repair. So um, this is the body's way of resetting itself, right? It's like charging your batteries. Um, so um, I just wanted to go over what we call sleep hygiene, what some checklists you guys can follow to make sure that you get deep quality sleep. Um, and obviously we know that sleep deprivation leads to accelerated aging, so we don't want that. So some facts here, um, what do some people do instead of going to sleep? 87% watch television, some people do household chores, um, they do activities with children, 36%, I would say that's way higher, 36% are on the internet, 21% um, are doing work related job, that's probably higher too, I don't know where I got these stats. Um, and then there was some uh, stats down here too, so women and men um, who sleep less than seven hours a night. They doze off during the day, they suffer from depression, fall asleep while driving, they rely on coping mechanisms like caffeine for stimulation. So you kind of get the picture. Okay, sleep hygiene, good checklist. Um, some things if you're having a hard time falling asleep. So um, the reason it says avoid alcohol within three hours of bedtime. Alcohol is actually a quick way to increase your blood sugar and make it crash. So that actually makes your body release cortisol. 
because it's saying, well, if your blood sugar is low, cortisol is going to get secreted to make sugar. And to your brain, that's a stress. And that can keep you up. So um, that's part of the reason. We obviously know caffeine because it's a stimulant and it can keep you up. Um, for some people, even anything after 12 p.m. Can, can keep them awake. It has to do with the way caffeine's metabolized in your system. Some people are slow metabolizers, so it can stay in their system longer. So don't you know, necessarily follow that 2 p.m. rule. It could be even sooner for you. Um, avoiding large meals or spicy meals, that could be stimulating, or your body may be using energy to digest rather than using it to sleep and repair. Um, so, you know, you might want to look at um, a lighter meal at night, maybe you have a, a larger meal during lunchtime. Um, you know, drinking more than four to eight ounces of fluid, maybe because it'll get you up in the middle of the night, kind of for obvious reasons. Um, and then if, um, you know, you're restless at night or you have um, sometimes tightness in your body or you have um, tendency to cramp, you might want to look at magnesium before bed. Um, magnesium is actually a very common mineral deficiency um, and um, a lot of times when you take it it kind of stimulates relaxation. It's actually big for people who have restless legs um, to be a, a deficiency. So um, something to think about taking before bedtime. Um, ways to prepare. So you know plan for it the way you plan for a meeting. Um, just make sure you, you set aside. Um, the we, most recent research I read is that anywhere between seven to nine hours is um, the best duration for um, kind of the repair mechanisms of your body in terms of the sleep hours that you need. Um, so it doesn't have to be eight and a half. Listen to your body. Some people say seven is enough to make them be refreshed. Others may eat nine. It might be seasonal, you know, the winter time when a hibernate longer. But just listen to your body. The, the rule should be that um, you have sustained sleep and you wake up feeling refreshed. Um, try to go to bed around the same time. I think regular sleep is just as important as um, you know the duration. So people who have erratic sleep patterns, they find themselves more fatigued. Um, so that also resets your biological clock. And then for some people, if they take naps longer than 45 minutes during the day, it actually kind of messes up their sleep cycle. So um, some people feel great with a power nap, like 20 minutes, maybe even 30 minutes. Um, you know, in some cultures we have siestas, you know, around like 3 or 4 p.m. just to get your body ready for the second half of the day. So if you need that, there's nothing wrong with that. But just watch out for some people. It actually keeps them up later at night. Um, and then the last few other areas. So, you know, um, avoid things that cause anxiety and tension So um, before going to bed. So... Um, you know, watching like CSI Miami or something or some stimulating show, you know, avoid that or paying the bills or talking about anxiety provoking um, arguments. Um, you know, just plan for it before. Don't try to go to bed with it. I mean, it definitely can even affect your dreams, right? So, um, you know, just definitely something to be mindful of. Um, strategies for falling asleep. Um, we used to say, um, reading a boring book <laughs> will do the job, um, but you know, just something neutral, nothing stimulating or you, know, you can't stop turning the page. So, um, and just use like a low light, not like a fluorescent light that keeps you up. Um, and you know, some people, they sometimes wake up with thoughts in the middle of the night. You could actually, the process of transferring it on paper helps you release it. So um, if you wake up with thoughts in the middle of the night, just write it down and go to bed. Or some people, as soon as they put their head down, it's the first chance they've had to relax. So suddenly this list starts running in their head. So just write it down. Your brain's meant to transfer information, not hold on to it, right? So um, just, you know, make a journal or just transfer that process. Um, and you know, if any of this you've done and you're still having trouble, um, you might want to think about measuring your cortisol. Um, cortisol is basically, as I mentioned, a stress hormone, and um, it doesn't mean that no one should have cortisol levels. You know, there's a certain rhythm that your body has, the highest levels in the morning, which is what gives you the drive to get up, but the lowest level of cortisol is at night. So some people have like an inverted pattern where their cortisol shoots up at night and then in the morning it's too low. So they wake up kind of like groggy in the morning and they need their coffee to get going, but then at night they're wide awake. So um, by measuring cortisol, we can actually look at ways to balance your cortisol levels rather than just taking a medication like Ambien to 
um, treat the symptoms. So this is more kind of finding the cause. Um, and then lastly, looking at the quality of your bedroom. So, um, you know, especially if you have allergies or nasal conditions, think about like a HEPA filter or some kind of like an air purifier. Um, and um, this is something um, we maybe don't necessarily think about, but just staying at least five feet away from electrical fields. Um, a lot of us put our cell phone right next to our head or we have like alarm clocks or, um, you know, there's some research that, that that actually can be stimulant for our body. So um, it has to be five feet away from your head. Um, so you can think about moving it somewhere where, um, you know, it's not doing that. So that could be things like electrical outlets, clock radio, steroids, um, steroids, stereos, um, <laughs> computer monitors, and cell phones. I should definitely add that in there. So um, just keeping that away. And I think that's it. So um, we'll just um, maybe turn the, turn the camera off. And then